Well, hi guys, welcome to the webinar. Uh, we're looking at nine practical applications of Tin Can APIs, so you're in the right place. I'm Andrew Downs, you've got my contact details on the screen in front of you. Um, you've also got my, my Twitter, Mr. Downs, and I do a lot of tweets from Project Tin Can as well. And we're going to be doing, we're live tweeting this webinar, so there'll be a number of tweets coming out. So if you use Twitter, or even if you don't, you can go to twitter.com slash project tin can, and there'll be links of all the stuff that I'm talking about, and some images, and some summaries, so it's worth following along on Twitter as well. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so you'll be emailed out a link to the recording afterwards, uh, and it'll be up on YouTube. So let's get started. Now, when I talk to people about tin can, I always encourage people to start small. Often people have really big ideas, but if you start small, maybe run a pilot, um, it, it can be a lot easier to, to get hold of, a lot easier to get started. We're going to be looking at nine different applications today, but I want to encourage you, don't think that you're going to do all of those nine things. Pick one of the ideas that we look at today and have a go with that. Run a pilot and then build on it from there, maybe bringing in one of the other ideas or diving deeper into the, the, the particular application that you're looking at. So. As we're looking at practical applications, ways to get started, there's different ways you can get started with TinCan, different things that you need to do, and I've categorized them. I'm using these little tags, these little icons, um, to talk about the, the different things that you can do as we're looking at each of the, the applications. So firstly, design. Some applications require you to do a little bit of thinking, a little bit of planning about what you're going to do for your project. Buy. You might be able to buy an off-the-shelf tool that meets some or all of your requirements. If it doesn't quite meet your requirements, maybe there's some development work to do. Either you do that in-house or some external development. Um, or maybe you can ask your vendor. If, if your vendor provides a tool that nearly does what you need, you can ask your vendor for a certain feature. And finally, join in. Some of these applications, it might be relevant to get involved in a particular community group. and um, be involved in helping to, to advance that particular idea. And we'll talk about, you'll see these icons, they'll make more sense when you see them in context in a moment. So the nine applications we're going to be looking at, I'm just going to list them now, and then we're going to run through them in a bit more detail. We're going to look at learning analytics, we're going to look at better blended learning, adaptive pathways, just-in-time performance support, mentoring, team learning, multi-device learning, LRS to LRS communication, and open badges. And as I said, as we're going through, think about which one of these can you apply in your organization this year. Uh, now, for all of these applications, you're going to need an LRS. So rather than me telling you nine times that you need an LRS, I just want to put this at the start. Whatever you do, you will need an LRS. And it's important that you choose your LRS carefully. And fortunately, most LRSs offer a free trial. In fact, with someone like Scorm Cloud, you can keep using Scorm Cloud indefinitely. Um, and there's a lot of variety in the different LRSs, there's a lot of variety on, on what's on offer in terms of level of analytics, reporting, other features on offer. So do pay attention to what LRS you're, you're getting. Consider your immediate needs and also consider your possible future needs. So it may be that initially you don't need a, a lot of analytics and reporting and something like SCORM Cloud, SCORM Engine might be appropriate for you. Um, but you might want to think, well actually in future I'm going to need more analytics and reporting. So I might go for something a bit like Watershed. And consider conformance. If you've been following our blog, you'll know that recently we've done some work towards a conformance suite. And that's an area you, do, you should ask your LRS vendor about. What are you doing about conformance? Have you run the conformance testing suite? It's an important question to ask. Um, it's not necessary that the, the LRS passes the conformance testing. It may be that they've got a very good reason. They might, that the conformance testing suite is still under development. So they might disagree with some of the tests, and, and that's perfectly valid at this stage, um, but they should be certainly looking into it and certainly doing something about it. They should be able to answer the question when you ask them, what are you doing about conformance? So whatever we're doing, you're going to need an LRS. On to the first, learning analytics. And you may have heard us talk about learning analytics once or twice in the past. In fact, if you go to our webinars page, tincanapi.com forward slash webinars, you'll see there's a whole load of previous webinars, uh, most of which were talking about learning analytics in, in one way or another. And there's some screenshots there from Watershed LRS and the analytics that, that are available in, in Watershed. Um, so learning analytics, what is it? 
Well, it's tracking learning and workplace, analy uh, workplace experiences from multiple sources. It's about bringing in data from all kinds of different sources into one central place and then comparing and correlating that data, whether that's training and job performance or actually we're seeing people looking at various different pieces of data. Uh, it always tends to be one element that you can control, which might be training, and another element which you don't directly control, like job performance, and seeing how you can change something within the, the element that you control, the training, and have an impact on the element that you don't control, the job performance. So it's about collecting the data together, analyzing that, and then using that data to improve future learning interventions, to make things better, to, to do things in, in a better way. So how do you get started? Well, the first step is to define a question and answer to. So recently we did a webinar for AT&T, and the question that AT&T wanted to answer was, is it worth investing in high-fidelity e-learning? Or is cheaper, um, less engaging e-learning actually just as effective? That was the question I wanted to answer. I'm not going to tell you what the answer was. You can go and watch the AT&T webinar yourself. Um, but that was the question they wanted to answer. The next step is to outfit your learning and workplace activities to send that TinCan data. So you need to be um, doing a little bit of development work, perhaps, or asking your vendors of the various products that hold the data. Um, do that work so that they can send that data into an LRS. And then within the LRS, you need to create reports that will answer your question. And again, that might be something that you need to develop yourself, or it might be something you could ask your LRS vendor for. So that's how you can get started. How can you go a little bit deeper once you've maybe done your initial pilot? What are the next steps? Well, you can define additional questions to investigate, look into different areas. You can outfit more activities to send data, start collecting data from lots of different data sources. And then perhaps you'll find correlations that you weren't expecting. So initially, you're a particular question, and you're just collecting data about that question. But the more data you start collecting, the more interesting correlations you can find. And you might find some, some unexpected stuff that you weren't even investigating. And again, that's something you can ask your LRS vendor about. Some technical tips. I know you're not all techies on this webinar, um, but I've put a technical tip slide in for each application, just for the, the, the technical people. Um, the steps you'd want to follow in collecting data is first you'd look at do you actually have access to the tool that contains the data itself. If you do, great, you can then outfit that tool to send TinCan data. Uh, if not, you can use what's called a connector, and a connector will either uh, be an external application from the tool that contains the data, and it will either pull data directly from the application's database if it's got access to it, or it might use the application's API to pull data and then translate that into a TinCan API. Um, so not all applications support TinCan, but a lot of applications do have an API, which can then be translated into TinCan statements. For this development work, you should absolutely use our code libraries. They're absolutely free. They're open source. You can use them. You can ask us questions about them, and they will save you time. Um, and also, use our recipes. If you're not familiar with recipes, I don't have time to talk about it today. But go to tincanapi.com forward slash recipes to find out what they are. Uh, recipes, again, will save you time and will in help to improve the interoperability of your data. They'll help to, to make sure that things will work together better. So that was um, learning analytics. And as I say, there's lots more about learning analytics on tincanapi.com. Uh, our next application, Better Blended Learning. You may have seen the blog that I did back in November talking about this very issue. And in that blog, I use the analogy of pavlova and eat and mess, two desserts that we have here in the UK. And pavlo both desserts have the same ingredients, meringue, cream, and strawberries. With pavlova, the meringue, and the cream, and the strawberries are separate layers. They're completely separate. With eat and mess, they're all mashed up together. And you can't really tell where the meringue ends and where the strawberry begins. Now, with our blended learning, often in practice, blended learning is a bit like pavlova, where the different elements of the blend are very much separate. The e-learning happens over here. The face-to-face -face training happens over there. The marketing campaign is, is completely separate entirely. 
But wouldn't it be good if our blended learning was really actually blended, was, was really mashed together, um, where our online stuff and our face-to-face -face stuff and our marketing campaigns were all just mixed up, and what happened in one impacted the other. And that's what the better blended learning is all about, is where what happens in one element impacts another element. It's about creating coherent learning solutions, overall learning journeys for our learners, not just a collection of standalone resources that don't really match up and don't really fit together. And this idea might seem like something that's out of reach. It might seem like something that's just too much of a challenge. But actually, you can use off-the-shelf authoring tools for this. There might be a little bit of custom, in fact, there is a little bit of customization, a little bit of development work um, that you need to do or you need to ask your authoring tool vendor to do. Um, but not a large amount, and it, it really is something that's within, within reach that you could do in your organization. Uh, as an example of what I mean by this, perhaps we've got two learning experiences. These might be online experiences. They might be offline experiences. Um, I'd recommend for your first pilot project, if this is the particular use case you want to look at, it makes sense to choose two online experiences just to make things easier. Um, but this could absolutely be done with uh, offline face-to-face uh, -face activities as well, would just require a little bit more work. Um, so you'd have one learning experience where the learner chooses a particular option in a scenario. That would feed through to the learning record store. And then in another learning experience, it might unlock a particular section of the course. So we're seeing that what happens in one learning experience impacts another learning experience. So how do you get started? Well, choose your two learning experiences that you want to link up, and then the event triggers and handlers that you want to link together. Now, triggers and handlers uh, a few times this webinar. These are important terms, and I think the definitions are going out on Twitter as I speak. But a trigger is um, something that the learner does that causes something to happen. So in the example of the diagram here, the learner chooses a particular option in a scenario. That's the trigger. And the handler is the thing that happens as a result of that learner action. Um, so a particular section of a course is unlocked. And actually, you'll see throughout this webinar, we'll be talking about triggers and handlers and how we, we can link those together. So you're going to choose your two learning experiences. You're going to choose how those learning experiences are going to link together, what the trigger is, what the handler is. And I would recommend start off with just a small number of links initially, and then you can build on that in future. You're going to need to get an authoring tool that's got actions features. Um, and most off-the-shelf authoring tools do have some kind of action capability. Uh, I've mentioned Articulate and Adobe there, Storyline and Captivate, um, Lectora, Zebra Zaps. All, all these authoring tools have actions features built in. Uh, and the actions features allow you to say, when I click this button, make this thing appear, or increment the score, or, or do something, play a sound. Um, so they've got these action features, but they're very much tied to what happens within the learning experience. You can't feed in what's happening outside the learning experience unless you use Tin Cam. So get an authoring tool with, with action features as a baseline, and then there's maybe a little bit of work to do to have that tool send Tin Cam statements on the basis of learner actions inside the authoring tool, inside the, the, the learning course and then receive Tinkan statements and actually trigger actions within the e-learning course. And I've put Lectora and Zebra Zaps slightly lower down because they actually do allow you to send Tinkan statements based on actions. They don't allow you to receive Tinkan statements. I'm not aware of any authoring tool that's doing this yet, uh, um, but to ask your authoring tool vendor about. And one of the motivations for us doing this webinar is at conferences, lots of vendors were telling us, we want to be doing Tin Can, and our customers tell us that they want to do Tin Can. But when we ask them, well, what do you want to do with Tin Can, they kind of shrug their shoulders and that they don't really know. Well, this is one thing that you can do with Tin Can, and this is what you need to ask your e-learning vendors for in order to achieve it. You need to ask them for the ability to send and receive statements linked to actions. Next step, so that would be that you know your first pilot project. If you want to take things a bit further, you might look at additional links between your courses. You might look at pulling in data from uh, a whole web of different learning experiences to trigger and handle events. Uh, and you can also measure the effectiveness of those links via pathway analysis. And this is another important theme throughout this webinar, 
that all of these different applications, whatever you're doing, they're going to be generating tin can data in order to facilitate the improved learner experience. But all of that data, you can then use that for analytics as well. You can take the data that you're collecting already, and then you can do more interesting learning analytics. Uh, and that's something to ask your LRS vendor about. So some technical tips. Um, obviously, you can ask your authoring tool vendor if they can add these features. But if they don't respond or you don't get a positive response from them, um, you don't necessarily need the authoring tool vendor. A lot of authoring tools have plugins or widget features where you or uh, you know, perhaps a third party could develop a plugin or widget that would add these features onto your authoring tool. So that's an option. Um, and the, uh, the way this would work is you might have one plugin that's triggered by the authoring tool's actions features and sends a statement. So the learner clicks on something in the authoring tool, that feeds into the whole action system, and then that spits out a tin can statement. And then you've got another plugin that listens for a tin can statement. When it sees that particular statement, the learner did this particular thing, it then plugs into the action system and causes something to happen. Whatever your authoring tool allows to happen, uh, system. So we're not reinventing the wheel here. We're using existing features of the authoring tool. We're just plugging Tincan in. Again, use our code libraries, use our recipes, and whatever you're doing, always use code libraries and always use recipes. Next up, adaptive pathways. This is quite similar to um, the better blended learning example, but in this case, it's more about a learning management system. So the way this works is that what happens in, in a learning experience can affect which future learning experiences you're presented with. And like authoring tools have um, action features, many LMSs will include adaptive pathway features, perhaps based on completion, based on score. So for example, Moodle has a feature which it calls conditional access. Um, and I think Blackboard has, has one called adaptive release. It's the same, same theory. Uh, it's, it's an adaptive pathway feature that enables certain experiences to be released based on what the learner does. But they're tied to what happens in the LMS. They can only release content based on the data that's in the LMS, um, which means if the learner does something outside the LMS, you can't use the adaptive pathway features with that data. Or if you want to look at some very detailed element of a particular experience, maybe it's any learning course launched from the LMS, um, you can't, again, use that with the adaptive pathway features because the LMS doesn't have access to that particular piece of data. So using TinCan, you can inform these adaptive decisions based on more specific events within the learning experience and also based on activity that happens outside of the LMS. So as an example, very similar to the better blended learning example, the learner chooses a particular option in the scenario again, and this time a particular e-learning module is, in, is launched on their LMS. Um, that first trigger could, could be anything. It could be doing something in a face-to-face -face course. But again, to keep it simple, for your first pilot project, I would recommend choosing something that happens online um, and linking up online activities first, and then think about adding in those face-to-face -face activities, those other um, offline activities. So how do you get started? Well, you need to design your adaptive pathways. So what are the different journeys that you want the learners to take through um, the, your LMS? And then identify the triggers. So we talked about triggers before. Trigger is on the left-hand side here, learning experience one, where the learner chooses a particular option in a scenario. But you can have a whole variety of different triggers. Anything that can be tracked with TinCan um, can be a trigger. Next up, ensure that your LMS can release or promote learning based on statements. And I'm not aware of any LMSs that could do this at the moment. So this, this is something to ask your LMS vendor for um, or develop yourself as a, as a plugin. Um, for Moodle LMS, for example, I've, I have actually developed a plugin that you can use to release content based on TinCan statements. In its current form, it will probably be, it might not be the nicest experience. Um, to use it for this particular function because it's actually designed for launching Tincan um, e-learning. But with a, a little bit of work, it could actually run very smoothly. And even without a little bit of work, you, you, you could make it work um, for, for your learners for a, a pilot project. 
Um, next up, ensure your learning experiences can send the right statements. So this goes back to exactly what we're talking about with better blended learning, where you need to be able to generate those tin can statements in some way, uh, whether that's generating them from, from the authoring tool, uh, or whether you've got some other um, tool which will send tin can statements. You just need to be able to, whatever your, uh, your triggers are, you need to be able to generate tin can statements for those triggers. Taking it a little bit deeper, you might think about additional inputs into your adaptive pathways, different places where you can get the data. You might think about, um, out, once you've identified those additional inputs, you need to do development work to outfit those learning experiences to send statements or, again, ask your vendor. Um, again, you can use this information for learning analytics, something to ask your LRS vendor for. And the, you know, where it gets really interesting is where you're not designing the adaptive pathways anymore. Um, you're automatically creating the adaptive pathways based on all this data that you're collecting. Um, uh, one of our developers recently posted, we, we use Yammer for social networking in, internally. One of our developers recently posted that he, he'd done some work for a client to um, automatically display content to people uh, based on the, the learning experiences that, that they completed compared to learning experiences that other people completed. And if you complete a learning experience, and uh, somebody else has completed that same experience and then went on to do something else, that something else then, then gets recommended to you. Uh, and I, I think that, that kind of thing could be really um, impactful. Could be re we could get some really interesting results from that. So that's, that's an area that you, you could do, you, a, a place you could take these adaptive pathways, automatically generating those. Um, and that, that may be something to ask your LMS or your LRS vendor about, um, or perhaps do some development yourself. Um, technical tips, use the, the same statement sending plugins developed to support better blended learning. So if you're generating data from authoring tools, you can use the same plugin side. Um, perhaps my Moodle plugin is open source, so perhaps that might be relevant for you to have a look at. Um, and the link to that is going out on Twitter as we speak. Um, use our code libraries and recipes, as I will continue to say um, for every application. Next up, just-in-time performance support. Now, just-in-time performance support is all about providing the information that somebody needs to do their job at the point of need. A really basic example of that is a sign on a particular machine that tells you how to use that particular machine. Now, obviously, in that case, you don't need tin can because it's a paper-based sign, um, but that gives you an idea of the, the, the kind of area that we're talking about here. So the example I've got on the screen is a doctor. Perhaps the doctor diagnoses the patient with diabetes. Um, unfortunately, diabetes patients don't come with signs that tell you how to interact with them, uh, printed on them. Um, so instead, perhaps we could deliver that information to the learner's mobile device. Um, based on the trigger, the doctor's diagnosed a patient, that's entered into a system, that then gets tracked back to an LRS, and then we get a notification, oh, here's some information on how to talk to patients about diabetes. We see you've not done that before. That's the kind of uh, the, the goal. That's, that, that's the sort of thing that we, we're talking about here. Uh, and the idea is that what happens in your job immediately gives you relevant learning and support materials. So it ensures that performance support materials are relevant to the learner. It's not just like, oh, here's some resources about talking to patients about diabetes. You might find this helpful in the next month or so. You might not. Um, and it's, it's delivering the right materials at the point where they're needed. So as the learner needs these materials, they're getting delivered to them. So here's the example. The learner performed a particular job task. That feeds into the LRS. And then some sort of delivery system will send the learner a relevant performance support resource. So your first step is you need to get a load of relevant performance support resources. Uh, if, if this is an area of interest to you, you may already have a number. Um, and then you want to use action mapping to map those performance support resources to certain triggers. If you're not familiar with action mapping, I strongly recommend after this webinar, go onto Google, type in action mapping, Kathy Moore, or follow the link that will be on Twitter about now um, and find out about action mapping. Action mapping is a great way of ma making sure that your learning interventions meet the needs of the business and the needs of your learners. Um, so hopefully when you've created performance support resources, you might have used something like action mapping to ensure that the resources are relevant to a particular uh, job behavior. 
Um, and so you've perhaps already done the work to identify which particular job tasks need um, those particular resources. And, and you might have a very large number of job tasks, and I recommend for a pilot project, just pick one. Don't even, don't even go with two, just pick one particular job task that you're going to deliver the resources for. Start small and then build on that. Um, you're then going to want to trigger statements from the work task. That's going to need to feed into some sort of a delivery system, which you may need to develop um, and then deliver it to a mobile app. So you, you may see that this particular use case probably involves a little bit more work than the other ones. So unless this is an area that's really of interest to you, it, you may be better off starting with one of the other applications um, and then having a go with this one. Once you've started to get a bit of tin can data in your LRS already, you'll find it's easier to add on other applications such as this one. Um, taking it deeper, um, you can obviously map more work triggers. You can measure, start measuring the impact, doing the analytics, um, measuring the impact of those resources on job performance, and then obviously improve those resources based on the data. And if you saw our last webinar, um, there's a, a similar use case, risk with their PDF annotator, they were collecting tin can data as a way of improving those PDF resources where you can collect data about the impact of those resources on job performance and then use that to improve those resources. And uh, again, if we take it even further, we can begin automatically mapping resources based on data. We can see, well, this particular resource had a really big impact, a really big positive impact on job performance. So we're going to promote this a little bit more. This other resource, um, well, actually, that made job performance worse. So we won't promote that one, uh, and maybe that gets flagged up to, to be improved. So you can start to automatically choose those resources. Again, that's, a, that's very much a next step. You don't want to be doing that in your initial pilot, um, but that's, that's the goal. That's where you're, you're going with this. Technical tips. Uh, as I said, it will require a lot of initial effort, so consider one of the other projects first. Um, but if you do go down this route, use our code libraries and use our recipes. And if, if anyone is going down this route, please do reach out to me. You've got my email address. If you don't, it'll be on the last slide, uh, or not quite the last slide, near the end. Um, you've got my email address, and you can, you can get in touch. Next up, mentoring. This is one example that is actually really easy to get started with or almost immediately. Um, so mentoring, this is about recording work tasks and getting feedback from a mentor. And that might involve taking a photo, taking video, taking audio, making notes from the work task, sharing these particular work tasks, and then getting feedback. Uh, in a previous job, I used to have a, a mentor relationship where, where I had a meeting in weeks with my mentor. And I found that really helpful, um, really valuable meeting. But one sort of downside was that often in those meetings, the stuff that we were discussing had already happened. Some of it had happened two weeks ago. So by the time we got onto the mentoring, it was almost too late. I'd, I'd already made all the decisions. I'd already done the thing. And there wasn't really much value in the mentoring apart from thinking about next time and, and learning from that experience. Um, so the kind of mentoring I'm talking about here, using Tin Can, perhaps with a, a mobile application, something like that, um, is where we're recording what we're doing as we do it and then sending that to a mentor and getting immediate you know brief feedback from that mentor and again as we're collecting the, this data this this mentoring relationship is going to be a real motivation for the learner to record what they're doing in their job and that recording what they're doing in their job is actually creating really valuable data for analytics particularly since it's, it's even been rated by a mentor so it's not just we're recording what they're doing, but we're recording how well they did it, which is you know, incredibly valuable information. Um, so for example, a learner might record a particular job task that they've done, feeds into the LRS, the mentor receives that, they review it, and they send some feedback to the learner. Maybe they, they sign off the learner. Um, to get started, there will be some design work. Design your mentoring strategy, work out how mentoring is going to work in your organization. Maybe it's already working in your organization. And then there's actually off-the-shelf tools that do this right now. I've listed two up on the screen there, TESS and TREK. 
Um, both great tools. I've, uh, you know, I've had chats with the, the people that develop, develop this. We actually featured TESS in a couple of webinars. I'm sure at some point we will feature TREK on a webinar. Uh, both great tools. Recommend you have a look at them. Uh, there's probably other tools out there as well. So um, you know, have a have a look broader. See which one best best fits. But these tools already allow you to do mentoring with Tin Can. So have a look at them and, and, and see if you can use them in your uh, organization. I've included the technical tips slide just in case you decided not to use the existing brilliant tools and build your own. Well, I imagine the way these tools work is that they're using attachments to send records of work um, to the mentor via statements. So file attachments, attach to Tinkan statements, and then statements are again used to return feedback to the learner. Uh, and I hope these guys are using our code libraries and uh, I, I strongly encourage them to use our recipes. Next up, team learning. Um, so often in, in real life, in work, we, we work in teams, we work together, we collaborate. And with classroom-based training, um, you know, even in school and university, and, and you know, most learning experiences, we have those learning experiences in teams, and that works really well. Team learning is, is very successful, but when it comes to e-learning, it's all individual. We're at a computer, we're on our own, we're learning individually, um, there's not really any, any kind of interaction often. Um, so, in this, this scenario, this particular application, it's where what one learner does impacts another learner. So if I'm in a learning experience, what I do affects the learning experience of my colleagues, my, my team members. People that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm actually involving them in my online learning. It's about creating learning experiences that mirror real-life work teams with different job roles. And I'm broadly talking about collaborative experiences here, but equally, this could be used for competitive experiences. So maybe I work with a lot of people that do the same job role. Uh, in that case, maybe I'm not going to collaborate, maybe I'm going to compete to learn faster, to, um, to do better. And again, like the better blended learning example I shared earlier, this is something that you can use off-the-shelf authoring tools for with a little bit of customization. It's something well within reach. It's not something that's, that's far off and difficult and, and, and complicated to, to implement. So, excuse me, just going to drink. So, uh, one example, learner one chooses in a scenario that feeds into the, the LRS, and that affects the choices available to learner two. If learner one does something wrong, it has an impact on what learner two needs to achieve. So this is going to work really well for scenario-based training, scenario-based learning experiences. It might also be that there's some kind of chat feature that allows learner one and learner two to communicate with one another, either at the same time, or maybe they, it's kind of turn-based. They take it in turns to do their part whenever they've got time to, to log on. It doesn't, just because it's team-based, it doesn't mean the team members need to be doing the learning experiences at the same time. So how do you get started? Well, first off, you want to design a multi-learner experience for two learners. Don't start off with 50 different job roles, just start with two. Keep it, uh, and then identify a very small number of links between the two. It might just be one link between the experiences. Keep it small, keep it simple. Um, and then exactly the same as, as the better blended learning example, get an offering tool with actions features, make sure your tool can send and receive TinCan data. Um, that might be TinCan statements, or the, there's other types that I'll talk about on the technical slide in a moment. Once you've done your basic projects, you might want to add additional events in there and you want to design an experience for, for more different learner roles, or you might want to add in some competitive elements, or add in some chat and communication features. And again, you can measure the effectiveness of these team relationships via learning analytics, because you've got all the data, you've got it all tracked as Tinkan statements. From a technical point of view, you could use Tinkan statements for the communication between learners. You could also use what's known as the Activity Profile API to share documents within learn between the different learners. Um, if you don't know what the Activity Profile API is, and you consider yourself a technical person that wants to know, 
we recently did a series of blogs um, about the document APIs. So if you go to tincanapi.com slash blog and scroll down to find the document APIs or just search for document APIs, you'll be able to find those, those blogs. And as I said, technically this is very similar to, to the better blended learning example. Um, and, and in fact, the customizations you make to your authoring tool for better blended learning could potentially be used for this use case as well. You might not have used the activity profile API, uh, but it might not take much to add that on, or you could just use statements for this particular example. So next up, multi-device learning. And multi-device learning, um, we often think about multi-device learning as a single learning experience um, that can be completed on any device. When it's, it's really the same experience, whatever your device you do, if it's on a mobile device, maybe it's a little bit smaller and, and reorganized a little bit, um, but it's the same learning experience on the, the different devices. But actually the great thing about mobile devices is the things that mobile devices are good at are different from the things that desktops are good at. So desktops are really good at uh, maybe simulations or displaying large amounts of tabular data or anything where you need a big screen for or where you might need a lot of processing power. Whereas mobile devices, clues in the name, are very good at, at being mobile. You can take them around with you. Um, and so I think this, this particular use case is going to be of real benefit in terms of onboarding where you've got a situation where you want to orientate the learner to a particular location. At anything where you want the learner to get out of their desk and do something, this is going to be a, a really interesting application. So the idea there is on one device impacts on another. And you've seen that the wording there is very similar to some of the examples that I've shared already. And that's because it, it is similar in terms of the, the technical implementation. But instead of um, multiple learners or multiple learning experiences, here we've got multiple devices. Um, and it's about designing a single learning experience that has elements that happen on different devices. So one element is designed to happen on a mobile device. Other elements are designed to happen on a desktop or a laptop or you know, something that's not mobile. And it's about taking advantage of the unique benefits of each device. And again, you can use off-the-shelf offering tools, maybe with a little bit of customization to do this. Uh, this one might involve a little bit more development than uh, the, the better blended learning and team learning, but still not a lot. It's still relatively simple. Uh, we're not talking about thousands of lines of code. We might be talking about maybe 100 or so or less. Um, so one example is uh, a mobile uh, device. Learner on mobile scans a QR code at a particular location. That QR code takes them to a web page um, or maybe an e-learning course that triggers a tin can statement. That tin can statement feeds into the, the LRS. Oh, just skipped a slide. Oh, wrong way. There we are. That feeds into the, the LRS. Um, and that then unlocks the next section of the desktop course. Or it may be the, you know, however you've got your desktop course set up, it unlocks a particular section of the desktop course. So how do you get started? Well, you need to design a desktop course that's got go and visit elements something where you're actually going to have to go somewhere. That might be to visit a particular location. That might be able to, to meet a particular person. Again, you need an authoring tool that's got actions features. Um, and that needs to be able to trigger tin can statements. And you also need to be able to trigger statements based on QR code scans. Um, and that might be something simple like, um, you know, it might be that the QR code scan takes you to an authoring tool. And you've got that set up to send statements. Or it might be that um, you, you create a very simple web page that just asks the learner their name and email address and then triggers a, a statement. Or it might be that if getting more advanced, you might create a whole mobile app that includes a QR code scanner. But that's going to be a lot more, a lot more work and not that you know, simple uh, pilot project. Um, you'll then trigger actions to unlock elements in the desktop course. So the, the QR code sends a statement to the LRS. That then, the, the desktop course receives that statement using the same functionality that you, you might develop for the better blended learning example. Um, and then based on that, it unlocks elements of the desktop course. Taking it a little bit further, you might define additional events. You might design more complex desktop and mobile or tablet specific experiences. You know, you can now go all out on your desktop course 
to make your desktop course as snazzy as possible without having to worry about mobile because you're using the mobile device for another element of the learning experience. Um, you might consider a custom mobile app that knows who the learner is so they don't have to enter their name and email address every time, might be a bit more secure. Um, that's a bit more work, but it's something that you, you could do. Uh, and again, you've got all that data, so you can measure the effectiveness via learning analytics. Technical tips, you can use the state and document APIs. Um, you can include uh, either tiny e-learning courses or bespoke pages to, to trigger statements from QR codes. And as I said, this is very, very similar to the better blended learning and team learning examples that we've already talked about. Uh, technically similar, but the outcome, the, the use case is, is you know, something, something new and, and something interesting. Next up, LRS to LRS communication. This is all about one LRS communicating with another LRS. And we recently ran a project um, with Learning Locker, Wax LRS, Saltbox guys um, to look into LRS to LRS communication. You might have seen the white paper that we published, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, if you haven't, don't worry. There's, there's plenty of time to, to catch up. So LRS communication is, is all about transferring statements from one LRS to another. It might enable you to link multiple systems within an organization. It might allow learners to take their training records with them. Or it might be really helpful when it comes to migrating to a new system. This is a, a, an important benefit of TinCan that I think hasn't had a lot of press so far. Um, if all your learning data is stored as TinCan statements, you can very easily migrate that data to a new system if you, if you want to change. Um, often people get locked into their, their learning management systems because all their legacy data is stuck there. Well, with TinCan, there's a potential solution to that problem as long as your learning management system does store all the data as TinCan statements. How do you get started? Well, I've got a number of links on the screen there. There's a white paper that goes into the benefits of, of statement sharing, the technical how-to, the particular project that we did, and there's a screencast of the, uh, showing a proof of concept that we created as part of that project. We're going to be running a webinar on the 5th of May. Go to tincanapr.com webinar, exactly where you registered for this webinar, and you can register for the next webinar. Um, and if you're using Cloud or uh, Scorn Cloud LRS or Watershed LRS, there's a how-to guide, how to set up statement forwarding on those particular LRSs. So that's, that's how to get started. Next up, open badges. You might have seen the blog post that I put out this morning around open badges. This is a very much a, a hot topic at the moment and, and one, to, one to watch, one to... to um, and the more I get into the more benefits I see of, of applying tin can to open badges. Uh, I'm not going to read through this list. You can look up the slides later if you want to have a look at this list. But the important point is there are lots of applications of tin can to open badges. If you don't know what open badges are, open badges are digital recognition of achievement. They're a bit like you know, people used to have uh, print certificates in the olden days. Um, well, the open badges are a modern version of, of printed certificates. They're an online digital image that recognizes your achievement, and they include hidden metadata that the computer can read. And when I say it's hidden, it's not like you need a magnifying glass to look at the image. Um, it's actually hidden in, in the cone image, so you can't see it no matter how close you look. Um, and it's, that metadata contains information about the learner and the achievement relating to that particular badge image that can be read by, by a computer. So I've got a diagram here showing a particular use case of what might be possible or what is possible if we apply TinCan to open badges. So let's say we've got three different organizations. Um, we've got an accreditation body who's interested in, in accrediting achievement. We've got an organization who wants their learners to be accredited and wants them to be able to, to show off their accreditation with the professional body but they don't want to share all of their learning data with the accreditation body because it's private, it's commercially sensitive. They don't want to give away all of, all of that le learning um, data. And then we've got the professional body who wants to allow the learners to update their CPD record with stuff that they're doing within their organization. So the accreditation body will have an application which I'm calling a badge definer. 
And um, I will say that th this term has been invented for this webinar. So this is very much early days. There are no tools that exist at the moment that are badge dividers, right? This is something that's possible that you could do, but it's, it's unlike the other examples that we've looked at, this one is very, very much leading edge um, and, uh, and new. So a badge definer would define, uh, the accreditation body would, would define a particular badge and say, these are the things that you need to do for this particular achievement. That will feed into the learning record store, which would be forwarded on using statement sharing um, onto the organizations, LRS. Um, the badge issuer, which ha then has access to the badge definition, but because it's within the organization, it's also got access to all the learning records within that organization. Um, it can then award the badge to the learner, it can match up, well, these are the statements that we need to earn this particular badge, these are the statements that, you know, these 10 learners have got those statements, let's award those badges to these 10 learners. Um, and then that data, along with the specific learning experiences, specific to that learner and badge, can then be passed to the learner's professional body, where they can display it in their CPD record, and the badges and achievements can be displayed on the, the LMS as well. Um, all this data transfer happens via tin can. You don't need an open badges backpack. You can you can store the badges in the learning record store. So it's kind of like a, a buy one, get one free, I suppose. You've got your LRS, you don't need the backpack. Um, and all the awarded badges can be localized to the, the user's language. So whereas open badge definitions generally are only in one language, using tin can, uh, I won't go into technical details, but it's possible to define a badge in multiple languages. And uh, uh, yeah, it asks me about the technical details if you're interested. As I said, this is very much a leading edge use case. So you can get involved in the open badges community of practice. We're working on developing a recipe. Uh, you will have seen from the blog post, we re released a, a recipe that you can implement. Um, we've, there's a prototype under development. It's not yet ready for release yet. Um, still a little bit of work to do on that, still being peer reviewed and, and whatnot. Um, but once that's released, you can try it out. Uh, and that prototype essentially enables many of the things in this particular diagram written in PHP. Um, and start building a business case, start thinking about how you could apply this in your organization. If, if you're a product vendor, um, you know, maybe, maybe you want to be the first person to create a badge definer or a tin can open badges issuer. So that might be the next step to have a go at, at creating one of those particular things. And I would say, because this, this one is so new, um, because there aren't really any tools working in this area, if you do decide to, that this is the use case for you, this is the application for you, please do get in touch with me. And um, you know, I, I'd love to work with you to, uh, to apply this particular use case. And I have actually already had um, at least one person get in touch with me about that. Uh, make sure you're following the Open Badges recipe. Make sure you, you look at the open badges prototype, use our code libraries, and, and consider statement signing. We're going to be talking about statement signing uh, a bit more later in the year, so I'm not going to detail now. So I'm going to have a poll now, um, and then move on to the, the question and answers segment. Um, so the poll, I, I believe, should be popping up on your screen right now, uh, and it should be asking you the question, how are you interested in using the Tincan API? Uh, I'd love to have your answers to that poll. Whilst you're answering that, um, I'd love to have your, your questions. You might have already been asking questions in the question panel, uh, and I, I'm ready to, to answer them. So I can see one question already coming through. Uh, pardon my ignorance. A tin can statement is a piece of JavaScript. Is that accurate? Um, that is sort of accurate. Um, so a tin can statement is, is something called JSON, JavaScript. Um, JavaScript object notation, I think that stands for. So it, it's, it is a piece of data that, that's similar to JavaScript. It's used within JavaScript. It's a way of describing a, a piece of data. JavaScript tends to be code that runs, whereas um, JSON is, is data, it's information. Uh, if you're interested in finding out what kind of data a statement can include, if you go on tincanapi.com and search for, um, for deep dive, um, or anatomy of a state rate blogs that, that take you through that. Um, somebody else has said, if I wanted to use Google Apps for learning experience, how does, does that work with Tincan API? Um, do learners have to manually track what they do? 
e.g. are they required to have a Google Hangout session as one of their activities? How, if possible, would that be tracked? Now, I don't know the specifics of Google Docs, so I'm going to uh, give you more of a generic answer, uh, or Google Apps, give you more of a generic answer as to how you can track um, stuff in general. And generally speaking with Tinkan, there's, there's four different ways that you can track things. The first way you can track things is to actually track the experience itself. Um, so an e-learning course, for example, will probably be very easy to outfit. To, to, it might already track using Tinkan data. And that's, that's generally the best way, and that's very straightforward. And if there's an application that you control, you can outfit that thing to, to send Tinkan data. Now, I imagine that Google Apps don't send Tinkan data by um, the next way, uh, the, the next way of, of, of tracking something is to track a, a, a proxy. Um, so tracking something that indicates that the thing happened. Uh, in the case of something like Google Apps, that might be using uh, the Google Apps API. Now, I don't know if Google Apps have an API, but I'd be very surprised if they don't. Google Apps probably have a, a bespoke API that allows you to get some, some data out. Um, and I imagine that that data could be translated into Tinkan statements. So that's, that's probably the, the route that you would take with Google Apps. If that isn't possible, um, there's two other ways of, of doing tracking. You can get the learner to track the experience themselves, and I kind of talked about that a little bit under mentoring. Um, you've got to be able to motivate the learner to do that in some way, but that's certainly possible. And then another thing is you get other people to track that the learner did the thing. Um, so that, that might be a mentor, that might be a manager, that might be a peer, that might even be a customer. So that, that might not apply with Google Apps, um, but you, you'd have somebody tracking that, that, that the learner did the thing. So I hope that answers the question. Uh, probably, I would say, the most likely best way to track Google Apps would be to use Google Apps Bespoke API, assuming it exists, and translate that into um, Tinkan statements. Okay, next question. I'm interested in open source, uh, ASP.NET MVC projects supporting Tinkan. Do you know of any? Well, funny you should ask. Uh, um, have, uh, we have a code library for c -sharp.net. I think that would be the same as um, ASP.NET. Uh, so if you go onto tinkanapi.com slash libraries, you'll see our c -sharp.net code library there, which will allow you to get started. I'd like to create a button in Capture 8 or Storyline 2 that when clicked on sends a Tinker phone to an LRS, is there code anywhere that I could use as a starting point? Um, there are a number of prototypes on tinkerapi.com forward slash prototypes that will show you code that will generate a Tinker statement. Um, and you could use that code as a guide to, uh, I'd probably start off with a simple HTML page and get that simple HTML page sending a statement. Once you've got the hang of that, you could then put that code into something like Storyline or Captivate. And feel free to email me afterwards if you need any further help with that. Is there any authoring application that generates SCORM compatible Tinkan, SCORM compatible content and Tinkan at once? Um, I did see an application that does that recently, uh, which we tweeted about. The name escapes me right now, but if, if you look at um, Tinkan on Twitter, and scroll up, there'll probably be several tweets now after this webinar, um, but the, the link will be there, and I will put the name in the question and answer blog afterwards. My LMS supports badges. Why do I need the Tinkan API for it? Um, well, maybe you don't, but a few benefits for using Tinkan with, with badges is that you can transfer those badges outside the, the LMS in the first instance, uh, and then perhaps in the future, as, as things as people start doing things more and more with this, it may be that a, a badge defined by an external organization, maybe an accreditation body, might be able to feed into your LMS, and, um, and then you could award badges based on that. Is there a no development required approach to developing a training learning program, assuming plenty of configuration but no programming? The, the one use case that I talked about today that doesn't require anybody to do any programming is um, the mentoring application, which I shared. But even with the other applications, 
just because there's some development work to do doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do it. Uh, you can ask your, your vendor. Um, so whatever application you, you want to look at, talk to your vendor about that and see if, if they're willing to do the development for you or it may be that you to do that. For students in Africa, use WhatsApp and Facebook on their mobile instead of forum in the LMS. How would you track these learning experiences? Facebook is a bit of a pain to track, um, but the best way to do that is probably an app in Facebook. Um, you, can, you can register as a Facebook developer. You can create an app and then track from that. WhatsApp, I, I'm not 100% sure how you, you can get data out of that. Uh, it may be that they've got an API. It may be that it's not possible. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Are there versions of ThinCAN like there are for SCORM? Um, sort of, but not really. The, um, the version of, of, of ThinCAN that was released on April the 23rd, I think, 2013, was version 1.0.0. Um, there are earlier versions, beta versions of ThinCAN that I don't recommend using, and if, if you are using those, you should totally upgrade. There are minor versions of ThinCAN that exist, um, but they don't involve any functional changes to ThinCAN. So you shouldn't really need to worry about versions unless you're, you're using a very old tool. Um, you should be using version, version 1 is the version to use. How do you authenticate a user on a mobile device with TinCan? Um, there's all sorts of different ways that you, would, you could do that. Um, one approach might be that the, the app itself, the, the learner um, registers with, with the app itself, uh, and the app might include certain information. To, so the app would, would essentially authenticate with the LRS and would confirm that the learner w was who they were. Um, it, that's probably quite a, a complex question. So uh, I, if you want to email me afterwards and maybe talk about your particular use case, that would be good. Do you know any major enterprise LMS owners that have adopted TinCan API for their LMS, um, such as SuccessFactors, Plateau, Blackboard, Meridian? From that list, the one that I recognize is, is Blackboard. If you go to tincanapi.com forward slash adopters, you'll see a list of all the adopters that support TinCan. Interfacing with um, current HR systems like SAP and PeopleSoft, absolutely. Um, this is the kind of thing that uh, I, I believe the Watershed team do fairly regularly, um, getting data from HR-like systems. Uh, it's all about, you know, I talked about connectors or perhaps you know, building plugins for those tools to get that particular data out. Are there any plans for your organizations to create an IFTTT -T -T channel? I'll be honest, I don't know what IFTTT -T -T is. So um, maybe if you, you might want to email me some more detail, or I, I might Google that afterwards, and we'll, we'll look at answering that in the, uh, the, the follow-up blog. We have a large library of, of legacy content that runs inside of a SCORM 1.2 compliant course player. In order to start capturing XAPI events from this content, should we construct a SCORM to XAPI translation layer? Should we use CMI5 standard as a guide for which XAPI property, verbs and properties to use when performing the translation from SCORM? Um, great question. I would not recommend translating um, SCORM content itself into XAPI simply because you've probably got a lot of SCORM content and it's going to be a big job. Um, instead, you, there, there are lots of tools out there, including SCORM Cloud, that will actually translate SCORM data into TinCan data for you. Um, so we're going to answer the rest of the questions uh, in a blog. But one last question. Where can I find a list of TinCan compatible applications or platforms? I think I've already answered that one. Uh, go to tincanapi.com forward slash adopters, and you will find a list of all the tools that we're aware of that are doing stuff with TinCan. Some of them are doing a lot, some of them are doing a little, um, but they're all doing something with TinCan. So um, thank you for uh, attending the webinar. Just quickly back to my slides. Just want to remind you of the summary. I've lost some of you already, but pick one idea from the ideas that we looked at. Pick one of them run a pilot with that idea, and then improve from there. Reminder of the, the nine different applications, uh, pick one of those. And if you want to drop me an email, let me know which one um, you're going to try. I'd be, be very interested. Um, you've got my email address and contact details there. Thanks for watching.